Hi, so I thought I'd make this video to share this with you and it's probably worth watching the video right the way through because if you do, you're going to learn to how to make a whole new type of solar cell. This is a solar cell that I don't think anybody's ever made before, so it's kind of really cool and it's sort of the birth of a whole new type of solar cell. Now unfortunately it involves exploring quite a few concepts. Some people may find the concepts difficult. I'll try to not make them difficult, but they may find them difficult and quite a number of chemical processes in order to get there. But I really wanted to share the whole thing with you, so if you want to follow it through, then it's probably well worth it because it's pretty cool when the actual solar cell is built. Now, it's made out of this stuff. This stuff you can't buy. It's called bistharia zinc formate, and it's an odd material in that when you heat it uh, 400 degrees for a little while, it breaks down into zinc sulfide. Now, the zinc sulfide is that material that you find in glow-in-the-dark uh, powders, so it's photoactive, that is, in, in light, it'll do something. So, my interest in this was to make electroluminescent inks, that's why I'm kind of interested in it. Uh, but, and this is a fine example of why I keep on going on about doing your own experiments, I made a mistake, I did something dumb, and when I did that dumb thing, I actually discovered this whole new solar cell. And it's really cool that science so often happens like that. It happens, an advancement happens, because you're involved in it and you're doing it and you do something dumb. And then instead of chucking it away, you think, hang on a sec, let's have a look at that. And then when you have a look at it, you come up with something really quite exciting. Now, I'm not sure whether this is real or not. It's very exciting, and I've done some tests on it, but clearly there's a hell of a lot more tests to do. So in order to make this solar cell, the first thing you need to make is this, this urea zinc formate. Now it's relatively easy to make as it happens. Zinc formate is quite difficult to buy, but really, really easy to make. You get some of this stuff, which is formic acid. This is 85% formic acid. You can buy in a whole load of um, concentrations. And it's readily available, it's easy to buy. You buy some of that and pour it into a beaker. And then you chuck a whole load of this stuff in, zinc oxide. And you just chuck it in until it stops fizzing, really, or if pH goes neutral, or you get sick of chucking it in and you need a bit of formic acid in there. So you put a whole load of zinc oxide and some formic acid until it dissolves, and it will actually dissolve and form zinc formate with a whole lot of other governments in there. So what you do is you heat it up and let some of the water boil off. When you've done that, let it cool down again, and those zinc formate crystals will drop out of solution into the bottom of your beaker. All you do is pour off the fluid and collect those crystals. Now you will have lost some zinc formate in the fluid that you just poured off. That's not really a worry, because those crystals in the bottom are almost pure zinc formate. Then what you do is you mix it back up with deionized water until it dissolves, after weighing it of course, so you know how much you've got, and you get some of this stuff, which is thiurea. Now thiurea is actually another easy to get hold of chemical, and it's used an awful lot by photographers particularly, you add that in some water, you add your zinc formate in some water, and the ratio is 2 to 1 mole ratio. Then you chuck the two of them together, give them a stir. When you give them a stir, you do exactly the same thing. It's a process called recrystallization. That is, you heat it up, boil a bit of water off, let it cool, and the crystals will drop out. And this is what will drop out. And this is your um, bistharia zinc formate, and that's what you're after. It takes a little bit of time to make it because of all the heating and the cooling that's involved in there, but once you get it, then you're pretty much there. Now, in my process of making this, I'm purifying that. And the way to purify is exactly the same way. Chuck it in some deionized water, heat it, recrystallize it, all the pure crystals will drop out. And I had some of this in solution that I was adding some water to. Now, I had a beaker of water and a beaker of this stuff. And you've seen this stuff before. This is the Lacy plating solution. It's um, oxalic acid, uh, ammonium sulfate, and um, trisodium phosphate. That's what's in there. Now, I've done a video on how to make this stuff, and I'll put a link to it. And instead of picking up the water, I, by mistake, picked up this, chucked it in there, and the whole thing went cloudy white, and I thought, oh, damn. Damn, 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 damn. And I let all the cloudy white settle out. And what I got was a solution like that. Now, one of those is water. One of those is zinc sulfide nanoparticles. Because the 
This thiourea zinc formate, which is soluble, reduced down to zinc sulfide, which is insoluble. When it agglomerated, because I wasn't controlling the conditions, then all the big particles settled to the bottom and formed, and formed this stuff. This white stuff is zinc sulfide. That's zinc sulfide, uh, and quite large particles actually. But after they dropped out, it left me what I thought was a clear solution. Now, there's a really easy way to tell whether they've got nanoparticles in your solution or not. And it's called the Tyndall test. And what you do is you shine a laser through it. So if I shine a laser through that, you'll see absolutely nothing. Because that one is water. There's no nanoparticles in it. If I shine a laser through that, watch what happens. See that green line? That green line is caused by the reflection of the nanoparticles in the water, and that's how you tell the nanoparticles in there. Now, if you watch that really carefully, you will have noticed something, and I'm going to show you again. What I want you to do is watch the green line. Watch what happens to the green laser line. So that green line shines up quite brightly at first, and then disappears. So the question is, why? So we've obviously got uh, nanoparticles in there, because it's past the Tyndall test. But those nanoparticles are photoactive. When the light hits them, then that line disappears. And that line will be disappearing, because the zinc sulfide nanoparticles will be getting reduced back to zinc ions and going into solution. And so the line disappears, because there's no more nanoparticles. Now, the interesting thing is, as you keep on doing that, they come back. They're in a kind of um, equilibrium. So they have a reaction there that is reversible in light, forming ions and metal and ions and metal. And that is really, really interesting. Okay, there's a kind of diode called the MIM diode. It stands for metal insulated metal. And they are absolutely fascinating kinds of diodes because they operate at high frequency. Now, when you look at a solar cell, there's actually two views you can have of a solar cell. You can have the particle view, the idea that a photon hits it and knocks out the electron. Or you can have the wave view. Now, if you take the wave view, there's a possibility of using an antenna. Instead of having the um, photons as particles hitting a solar cell, you have the possibility of collecting the radio, i uh, sorry, the EM waves that light also is. Because what that would require is if you want to rectify, you need a diode that operates at tremendously high frequencies. Now, luckily enough, a MIM diode operates at tremendously high frequencies. Now, a MIM diode has something called a band diagram, and ideally it looks like this. Well, we have distance here in nanometers. And here is energy in electron volts. Now, if we take a Fermi level to be 10, and we look at 11, um, 13, say, we take our first metal, and in between it, we stick our insulator, and then we have our second metal. Now, the work function has to be different. Now, the work function is the amount of thermodynamic energy required to liberate an electron. So let's say in our first metal, the work function is 1, and our second metal, it's 3. And we have that kind of shape through the insulator that is required to get an electron from one side to the next. Now, because they have different work functions, there is already an electrical field in existence between these two materials. And you can see that quite easily. That's exactly what a thermocouple is. You put two different metals together with different work functions, heat them. One will chuck out electrons, and the ones will take it. And that's because there's no insulator, insulator between. The insulator between them stops that happening. But if the insulator is of a special type, and usually it's the native oxide of one of the metals that allows tunnelling through that material, then this will act as a very fast diode. And it's very, very interesting for exactly those reasons, because it leads to the possibility of using a wave instead of a particle to collect solar energy. Now, if you think about the uh, thermocell, which we've done before, you immediately notice the similarity, or you should immediately notice the similarity between the thermocell and the MIM diode. Now, the thermocell uses metal 1, metal 2, insulator 1, insulator 2, which are two different materials and um, 
think one was an oxide and one was a phosphorus. So there certainly a native oxide there taking this part, and certainly phosphorus there playing some part. But essentially, it was a MIM diode with two insulating materials, probably forming PN junctions to help that electron transfer. But the whole idea of it is now coming round to looking at the thermocell in terms of a MIM diode. So there are four things that govern a MIM diode. The work function of the first metal, the work function of the second metal, the electron affinity of the insulator, and the band gap of the insulator. So we want something with a band gap that is an insulator and the zinc sulfide falls nicely in there. So all we really need to do is choose our metals. So why not use copper and aluminium? They have different work functions and they're readily available. Okay, so what I've got here is a tiny strip of aluminium and it's tiny because I'm going to put it between those two bands. They're copper. And I've only put two on because it was easier then to splodge on some of my zinc sulfide. And I splodged on some of my zinc sulfide. And we're going to connect up one of these to the copper and one of these to the aluminium. Now I'm going to fix the aluminium down to the bench because as you can see it wants to curl. So the reading on here is in microamps. Now I'm just going to lay that onto the aluminium. But in order to do that I need a little bit of electrolyte. Now this isn't an electrolyte, it's actually just water. So if I splodge a little bit of water on that and then lay that on we go. Almost immediately that jumps up. Now that will skip around a little bit, so what I'm going to do is put a ring on there to hold that flat, so the light can get to it, it can be held flat. And then a couple of iron weights, and we'll just let that settle down. So that's been running for about an hour, and you can see it's settling down at about 20.7, 20.8, something round about there. This one actually is amazing. It's been running uh, all day. It's now three o'clock, I did it this morning. So it's been running about um, eight hours or so. Still producing about 40 um, microamps. And you can see that one. That is actually a thin layer of the nanoparticles put between the two. And that's a uh, mechanical graphene sheet that I did as a counter electrode. And that has been generating for about eight hours. Uh, it's about twice the size, but eight hours for um, 40, 50 microamps. That's kind of cool, not being able to resist playing with this. I've stuck some titanium dioxide in there, and as you can see, it's bouncing around 25, 26. So, for a simple device, that's pretty cool. Now, obviously, um, microamps is not huge, but apparently, the uh, amount of sunlight hitting the Earth's surface on average is 100 milliwatts per square centimetre. So I give you some idea about the efficiency, which of this particular thing is quite poor. Now it uses something called interdigitation, which is where those fingers come down and you interlink the fingers. So it doesn't need a uh, conductive top coat, you don't need a transparent conductive oxide. But, there we go, a very, very interesting mistake. And I hope that you enjoyed watching and thank you very much.